real pleasure to be here just two weeks after what was an astonishing event for us um, in the European Space Agency. And as you heard, for uh, many people around the world, and I have to say that I really do enjoy my job. And uh, I have one of the coolest jobs imaginable, which is to come and talk to you and to talk to the world about something absolutely astonishing, a complete first. Nobody's ever done this before. And before I even start, just to make you, you know, understand it's not actually, for me, about this mission. It's not about landing on a comet. It's about that inspiration that that can bring to a whole generation of kids, adults, that we need to be inspired because we need to save the planet we actually live on as opposed to the rest of the universe we're looking at. And only through inspiration and getting kids involved in engineering, in technology, in science, that's, you know, one of the themes of the whole TED exercise is to get people engaged in, in this because we're not going to save the planet we live on by wishful thinking. We're going to save the planet by working damn hard at it. But let me tell you about this inspirational beast, Rosetta. Now, you know, we've done something amazingly, amazingly smart here. But, you know, actually, we're all just apes. We are 1% away in our DNA from the apes. That 1%, of course, is what separates us and has made us do amazing things. It's also made us do very bad things, like killing off most of the other apes, unfortunately. But that's how apes are to some extent. Now, it's in the last 50 years that we've understood this, that we've understood that the 1% difference between, that there is only 1% difference in our genetic makeup through our understanding of DNA. And in that last 50 years, there's been this astonishing revolution in our understanding of the universe as well. Part of that comes from this curiosity that we have to understand the environment we live in, and part of it comes from the technology that's been developed in this last 50 years. Now, much of the universe is completely inaccessible to us in the sense it's just, we just can't go there. Maybe in the deep, deep future we will be able to. But to go beyond our own solar system, we have to use telescopes. We can look out into the universe and try to understand it at a distance. But you know, there are places where we can go. In the late 1960s, of course, in the early 70s, American astronauts went to the surface of the moon. Now, I just want to create you a little scale model because it's important to, to think about the, the, you know, where these things are. If I take the whole Earth and shrink it down to just this size here, then the aeroplanes that fly from Schiphol to other places fly at the width of a human hair above the surface in that model, 100 micrometers above the surface. The International Space Station, which you might see cruise across the sky occasionally, is at five millimeters above the surface. On that same scale model, the moon is four meters away, somewhere over there. That's quite a long way, okay? But it's doable. We can get there, and we can send human beings there. To go further than that, if we want to go to Mars, on the same scale model, Mars is two kilometers away, halfway down the runway, okay? It's a lot further away. So humans haven't been there. It's extremely difficult. But we've sent robots, extremely clever robots, this is the Curiosity mission, and it's so clever it knows how to take a selfie. Um, <laughs> now, we've been even further than that. This is Mars. Mars is a very interesting planet, of course, for the, trying to understand the origin of life and whether there's life elsewhere. But we've been further. This is the moon, Titan. It's, one of, it's the biggest moon of Saturn, and it's a very unusual moon. It has a very dense atmosphere of methane and ethane, hydrocarbons. In fact, if we really wanted to screw the world up, we would go there, bring all the hydrocarbons back, and burn them here, and we would have global warming in a couple of weeks. There's so much fuel on, on Titan. But we've been down to the surface nearly 10 years ago. Next month is the 10th anniversary. We landed on the surface of Titan, this extraordinarily uh, cold, bizarre moon, this, this world in itself. Not only that, but we could hear the wind blowing on Titan. As we descended to the surface, microphones on our lander, Huygens, actually picked up the sound of the wind in this alien world. So a really visceral connection with the universe that we can have. Now, that's about 12 kilometers away in, our, in my scale model. But, one of the most interesting, most engaging objects in our universe that we want to study in our solar system are the comets. Comets are bizarre objects. They, they streak into the sky, mostly unexpected. 
They turn up, they light up as they're heated by the sun. Water blows away from the comet. They're about 50% ice, 50% dust, and create these great tails across the sky. Many comets come in just once from the outer, deep outer solar system, race in towards the sun, create a great show, and then disappear, never to be seen again. But a great discovery made in the 1700s was that some comets come back repeatedly on the same period. And this is the most famous of them. Right at the top of the picture there, you can see in this famous uh, tapestry created uh, by the Normans when they conquered England, is a comet at the top. And the comet was held to be the sign of something astonishing that was about to happen. And it was. It was the conquest of England in this case. I have to say it was the last time it happened, a thousand years ago, but there you are. Um, and, of course, for some it was a portent of doom, for some it was a portent of good. But this is actually Halley's Comet, because this comet comes back every 76 years, repeatedly. And, in fact, we were able to visit it. In 1986, the European Space Agency had a mission called Giotto, and Giotto flew past Halley's Comet. This is it here, this incredibly strange object. Dark, mostly dark, but then with jets and plumes of material flowing away. But this was a flyby. We were only able in 1986 to fly past it at high speed, 68 kilometers per second. One go, a few minutes of data, and then it was over. Okay? In 1986, people immediately thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually go up to one of these objects and stop next to one and watch it as it changes, as it flies through the inner solar system? Now, why would we want to do that? What's special about comets? Well, comets are treasure chests. They're leftovers of material from the birth of our solar system 4.6 billion years ago. Material that never made its way into planets, but is left over from the birth of the solar system. And why is that interesting? Because if you look at the planet Earth today, much of what's here has been altered endlessly over the billions of years of tectonic movement and of earthquakes and of volcanoes and lots and lots of chemical processing. So if we want to understand the birth of our solar system, let's go and unlock a treasure chest and see the raw material that's left over inside. Not only that, though, because these comets also have two components which are very important. Firstly, they have water in them. And the Earth, when it was very young, was actually probably too hot to have water on its surface. And only when it cooled down did we get the oceans which we have today. But where did the water come from? If the Earth was too hot in the beginning, it was dry and arid. Well, the water could have come from comets. It could have been delivered later on. So by studying comets, we can actually examine the makeup of the water which is in them and compare it to the makeup of the water we have on the Earth and see if they match. And then the other component is that comets contain complex organic molecules. And these things are the building blocks of life. So indeed, you could be comet stuff. You could have been delivered in your component pieces to the planet Earth about four billion years ago, and the water in these bottles in front of you could actually have spent hundreds of millions of years flying around in comets. And so by going to investigate comets today, we can hope to piece together not only the history of the solar system, but of ourselves. Now, we created a short science fiction film to illustrate that, and I just want to play you one small piece of it. This is a, a dramatic view of how comets may have delivered water to the Earth. Science fiction is cool, okay? This film has had two and a half million views on YouTube in just four weeks, you know, so we're really proud. You should go and watch this film. It's called Ambition. It's a, it's a seven-minute film, fantastic. But we had to convert that science fiction into science fact. And we did that more than 10 years ago by building Rosetta. This is the main spacecraft Rosetta here. You can see the Philae lander is actually on the right-hand side there. This is about three tons, it's about two and a half meters as a cube. But it's not only that, to power this beast, we had to have huge solar panels which actually stretch over the, 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 the length of the wings of an Airbus A320. So this is a huge machine that we took and put out into space, and we did it by putting it on an Ariane 5 rocket in 2004. Now, 
I'm a rocket scientist, so I have to show a rocket launch. That's the reason for that. But, uh, but why did we do it 10 years ago? Well, because the object we wanted to go to is this strangely named object, 67P. That means it's the 67th periodic comet ever discovered. Periodic comets come back regularly. And it was named for the two people that discovered it, Klim Churyumov and Svetlana Gerasimenko. So if you want to discover a comet and get emblazoned out there, have your name in space, go and buy some binoculars. <laughs> now, the strange thing is that you can see our inner solar system, Earth, Venus, Mars, we're all on relatively circular orbits, but we want to get onto an orbit which is elliptical. And we don't have a rocket big enough to change our speed to put us on an orbit like that. So what we did was we cheated. We used the energy of the planets by flying past the Earth three times, and each time the gravity of the Earth grabbed hold of the spacecraft and pulled it and made it faster and pulled it onto a new orbit. And we did that three times, and we went past Mars once as well to borrow a bit of its energy. You know, fair's fair. You can't just take it all from the Earth. And that got us onto this elliptical orbit, which took us out towards the comet. On the way, we got some cool pictures of the Earth. This is the South Pole down at the bottom here. We even took a selfie at Mars. You can do that. This is actually a camera taken by Philae while it was bolted to the side of Rosetta. Now, on, we also went past one of these astonishing objects. This is an asteroid. So this is a, another object in the solar system, but not made now of water and of dust, but made of rock. And we came actually only about 3,000 kilometers from this object, but it still looked a bit scary as we flew past. And that was just a byproduct. We could fly straight past it on the way to the comet. Now, then we had to go to sleep for two and a half years. We were so far out in the solar system, we didn't have enough power on our solar panels. We were out at Jupiter. And so we turned an alarm clock on. The spacecraft was no longer pointing at the Earth, and we couldn't command it. We had to wait until it woke itself up. So those of you get up in the morning, you set your alarm and check that it's the right time. We set ours two and a half years and waited for January the 20th, and it came. It came 18 minutes late, and those 18 minutes were probably the longest of my life <laughs> and of many other people. If it had gone any longer, people would have expired, I can tell you. <laughs> but what that meant was we were alive. We actually got the signal back, and very soon afterwards, we began to see the object we were going towards, 67P. So this is a picture taken from, a series of pictures from Rosette, and you can see the object we're going to moving, but it turns into a comet. There's an outburst of material. We're not going to a dead rock, which is good. It means our guys are navigating right. Now, this is what we were expecting to see, because this is the best picture ever taken of a comet close up before. It's called Comet Temple, and it was flown past by a NASA mission about 10 years ago. Well, the Americans actually don't fly past things. They actually flew straight up to it at high speed and crashed into it. And uh, <laughs> we Europeans have a slightly different approach. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what they did, of course, scientifically, was to basically explode a bomb on the surface and then pull a material up from underneath to see what it looked like. But this was our picture of a comet, a fairly boring potato-shaped object, very smooth, easy to land on, of course. Well, in reality, when we got to our comet, 67P, by July, we were a bit surprised. Uh, did we have one object, or do we have two? This is what we saw. If we smooth that a little bit, we got this. And then, as we took a movie, this is what we saw. Now, this is the famous rubber duck that everybody talked about. Um, now, for scientists, scientists were beaming. Scientists thought, fantastic. Maybe we actually have two comets which join together. We can study two objects at once. But the engineers who had to land on this thing immediately, uh, they, they had the other face. They did not have the smiley face. They thought, how do you land on an object like that? That's it rotating. It rotates every 12 hours. Um, and the gravity, of course, of an object like this is changing all of the time. Well, we got closer, and it got worse for the engineers. It got a lot better for the scientists, because look at this thing. <laughs> it is just not a boring, smooth potato object. And what that means for scientists is that this object has changed during its life. It's evolved. It, plumes of material have flowed away from it, and Every time it goes around the sun, it changes its shape. And in fact, we even think there's a possibility it might fall into two pieces this time around the sun. So that should be something to look for next year. But again, the engineers were scratching their heads and thinking, oh, well, uh, yes, find me a smooth place to land. Now, in more detail, look at this. I mean, there's astonishing cliff-type structures. 
It just looks like a snowfield down there with boulders in it. We call this the ski resort. Um, <laughs> but you've got to remember that the gravity on this object is incredibly low. So when you take pictures like this and you see boulders hanging off the side of cliffs, well, just turn your head 90 degrees and start asking yourself, well, where is down on an object like this? It's not, you know, down is fairly obviously here at the moment. But when I'm in a comet and I've got a big piece of material over there and another one over there, which one's pulling me strongest? Where is down? So we, we try to study this object and try to understand its features. There are smooth planes and there's boulders everywhere. Just to give you a sense of scale, we call one of the objects the biggest boulder in this field. We call it Cheops because it looks a bit like a pyramid. But if you compare it to the real pyramid at Giza, it's about that. That's the pyramid at, G uh, at Giza, uh, the Cheops pyramid. So these boulders are about 20, 30 meters high. And what we don't understand at all yet is how they even got there. Did they roll there from somewhere, or did they actually just get eroded from underneath? Were they inside the comet, and as the comet was eroded on each passage around the sun, did they actually just get exposed on the surface? We just don't know that. But remember, we've only been there three months. There's so much more to do and so much we don't understand yet, so you're getting a real snapshot of where we are. Now, you've seen all these wonderful white pictures that I keep showing you, very nice details, but comets don't look anything like that in reality. This is a moon uh, of Saturn, again, called Enceladus, which is roughly reflects almost all the light it's, that falls on it. It's covered in ice. The Earth reflects about 30% of the light that falls on it. The moon only reflects 12% of the light that falls on it, but the comet, 5%. It really is there, I can assure you. It's in the picture. But that's what it would look like if you were standing next to it. So we enhance the images so you can see more, but they're really black, and that's because they're covered in dust and this organic material has been baked. This is our model of the comet. This is what it looks like if you were standing next to it and flying around it. A crazy, crazy, crazy shape. And of course, we had to go and land on this thing. We took a selfie again to say, here we are. We're at the, we're at the, the comet. And then again, from our science fiction film, we then deployed Philae two weeks ago, pushed it out at a few centimeters a second and it started descending to the surface under a, the weak gravity, about a hundred thousandths of the gravity we have on the Earth. And we had to wait hours because it was so slow, falling down towards the surface. Now, what actually happened, everybody knows. We did not lock onto the surface. We were aiming for this location here on the top, on the head. You can see that the landing area is about one kilometer across. We weren't guiding down. We were falling down under gravity. Somewhere in that area, we were going to land. This is what that area looks like in detail. And you can see now the series of images as we got closer to the surface. You can see it's about 100 meters across in the top right corner of the square down to the bottom. A picture, the, bottom, the smallest picture in that scene is only about 10 meters across, and that's the piece of land we ended up touching down on. And then we bounced, because the harpoons didn't work, the little retro thruster didn't work, the shock absorbers did, they took most of the sting out of the landing, but the gravity was so weak, we immediately flew back out into space. We could, if we were unlucky, have gone completely out into space and never touched down again, but that didn't happen. We now know what happened. We actually bounced, we, this is the descent coming here, the pictures from the bottom left are showing us approaching the surface, the little insets show filet. We touched down and then we flew off at an angle for two hours. Another two hours of flying across the surface and we just released something today, we think we clipped the edge of a crater as we flew across the surface, just with one leg and we started tumbling. So filet started tumbling through space but fortunately, landed back down on the surface, and this is the first picture taken from the surface of a comet. It's showing a rock face right in our face here, and we're in a position where we could do all of the science that we wanted to do. We weren't locked to the surface, but we could do the science. That picture, of course, on the other hand, might not be at that angle. We don't fully understand the angle we landed at. We think we landed against a cliff, side on. And you can kind of see this in a panorama. You can see the sky in the top right corner, the cliff down in the bottom, and Philae perched up against the side of a cliff. Now, Philae's battery, its first battery, ran out as planned after 64 hours, and we're in a place in the shade where there's not enough sunlight to illuminate the spacecraft to charge up its batteries again at the moment. 
As we get closer to the sun, the intensity will rise and there's a chance that next spring, Philae will spring back into life and we'll be able to do more science with Philae. But Rosetta is still there. Rosetta, the big orbiter with all the big experiments on board, is flying around the comet. It's at 30 kilometers from the comet today, and it's doing fantastic stuff. It's doing the great majority of the science, in fact. And so we know we have a fantastically successful mission already. We have lots of science to share with everybody coming up in the next few months. But Philae, hopefully, will come back to life. This is a cartoon series of cartoons we made, so we hope the little Philae is on the surface, resting at the moment. Um, but remember, the reason we're staying for the next year is because this comet's coming closer to the sun, and as it comes close to the sun, it will burst into life, and it's happening already. The comet is shedding material. We're going to have to stand back from this beast, this dragon, as it comes to life, but there's an exciting ride ahead of us. Next summer, August, is when we get closest to the sun. We will run through to the end of next year. Everybody should follow along. I hope you're all already, and thank you very much for your time. Thanks.